right, let's just pray and get right into this tonight. Father, we thank you so much, God, that you never have failed, you don't know how to fail, and you can't even comprehend failure in your mind, God. And so, Lord, you, we just thank you so much that if you can't fail, that you put that into us, that no matter what we do, whether we mess it up, Lord, you can't fail as long as we're going after the kingdom, Lord. And Father, just, just put that desire in us to, to go after the fullness of your kingdom, Lord, not not shrinking back from anything, Father, but just continuing to go forward at all times, Lord, because you never fail because you always go forward, God. You never back up. And so, Lord, let that same mentality be downloaded in us as your children tonight, God, that we have no other agenda in life, God, than just to serve the, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Father, be with this word tonight, God. Let it come forth in the manner you want it to have each ear to hear tonight, God, to encourage us to shape us and to mold us more into your image and for your likeness and in this earth for your glory, Father. And so, Lord, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Say amen. 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 Well, let me ask you a very simple question. It's my Wednesday night crowd. I know you guys are all saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, all the good stuff. Amen. amen. But do you know God? It's a very simple question. Do you know God? Do you know who he is? Do you know what he does? Do you know how he acts? And, and I've used this analogy so many times. One of, the, one of the things that I think really became detrimental to church several years ago, and please, I'm not trying to say, oh, well, I've just got it all figured out, and there, you know. No, it, it was a great intention. Some people, it brought them a lot closer to God. Some people took a, a very trendy thing that happened years ago, totally took it in, in, out of context, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about tonight. When you take God out of context, and you don't keep him in the proper kingdom alignment, then you can really get messed up. And this, this really messed up a lot of churches. It really messed up a lot of church leadership structures. And it was famous. It became a T-shirt, became a bracelet, became a slogan. WWJD, what would Jesus do? And most of you have heard me say that here at the time or two, but I'm kind of setting up the message for tonight based on WWJD. Uh, when, when that entered the mindset of people, and different leaderships of churches, different staff positions and stuff, they begin to interpret that out of what they know, what they understand, and what they want to happen. So it's not about what would Jesus do, because anytime you say, what would Jesus do, it leaves it up to your interpretation. Does that make sense tonight? Well, I think, because right now we're even living in some times where people really think that Jesus would sign a homosexual marriage license. You've got people who really think Jesus would do that, and we know Jesus never did that and never will do that if you know Jesus. But if you just know religion and you've got your opinions about who he is without facts of who he is according to his word, then you leave the what would Jesus do to your interpretation outside of what he did. Does that make sense? So again, it, that, 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 that movement brought a lot of people to Christ, that movement also brought a lot of people that were in Christ away from Christ because now it became about what they think Jesus would do based on their intelligence, based on their standards, based on their morals and not the morals of, of actual Jesus and who he was. So I call it, you know, we need a movement, WDJD, what did Jesus do, amen? And when you look in your Bible and you see actually what Jesus did, where he went, how he acted, how he responded, then that gives you the exact definition of how you and I are supposed to behave, how you and I are supposed to act, walk, and talk in this life. Can I have an amen? amen. So now, we know God. A lot of us here, we all know God. We know who he is. We know who he was. We even know some things he did. But tonight, I want to ask you, is God alive in you? A lot of people that know God, they know a dead God. He's not alive. He's not doing anything. He's not bringing any correction. He's not bringing any encouragement. He's just a religious dead figure in a grave or on a cross, wherever you want to have it, okay? But tonight, you need to understand something. The God you serve is not only alive in heaven, but he's alive in earth, and he's not alive in earth floating around out here in a mystic form. He's alive inside you. Can I have an amen? It's Christ in you, amen? Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 says this. To them God willed to make known, talking about the Gentiles here, what are the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is, say it with me, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen? That's still true today for us Gentiles. Amen? I, 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 I became a Gentile grafted in, but I'm a Jew because my father's Jewish. Amen? Amen? 
So if you tonight, if, if you've got Daddy Jesus, your daddy's a Jew, so that makes you a Jew. Amen? Grafted in through the adoption, whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. Amen? Hallelujah. Christ in you, not Christ around you, not Christ over there, not Christ at the synagogue or the church or the temple or whatever you attend. Christ in you all the time, going to your house, going to your job, going to town, going to school, going to wherever you go, Christ in you goes with you. See, when you get a concept of that, it's not about what would have Jesus done if he'd have been here. He is with you everywhere you go, therefore you represent him everywhere you go. Amen. Amen. I want to read that same Colossians 1.27 out of the Message Bible. And now I've got a couple of things I'm going to do tonight with the Message and the other Bible, the New King James Translation. But it also says this right here, Colossians 1.27 in the Message. God wanted everyone, not just the Jews, to know this rich and glorious secret inside out. Regardless of their background, regardless of their religious standing, the mystery in a nutshell is just this. Christ is in you. Therefore, you can look forward to sharing in God's glory. It's that simple. That's the substance of our message. I love that. I look, look at that. Christ is in you, therefore you can look forward to sharing in God's glory. But how many people dread having to be a Christian every day? Dread getting into those situations where you feel like Christ is wanting you to say something you're scared. See? You shouldn't be like that. You should be, man, I get to, you should look forward to tomorrow. You should look forward to going in where God assigns you around people that aren't saved. God assigns you around heathen people. You ought to look forward to that challenge, amen. Because the glory of God to you, through you, and in you is going to come out, amen. Amen. If, now here's the big tangents word, if. If Christ is in you, then how many would agree to me tonight we should walk like Jesus walked? Yes. Not walk like we think he walked, but actually walk like he walked. How many agree with that? How many thinks tonight if Christ is in us, the hope of glory, then we ought to talk like Jesus talked? Amen? Not what we think Jesus would say in a situation, but what did he say in that situation? Amen? How many thinks tonight that if Christ is in you, then everywhere you go, you are to act like Jesus acted. Not how you think Jesus would act in your situations, but how he actually did act in every situation he was in. When he faced sinners, when he faced crowds wanting to enthrone him and touch the hem of his garment, when he responds to children, when he responds to sickness, when he responds to, 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 the, to the Sanhedrin and, the, and the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, act like he acted. Not like you think he would. And then the last thing, if Christ is in us, with everything going around in our life, in our marriage, in our home, wouldn't it be neat if Christ was in us, then we started responding like Christ actually responded. Like God responds. Not like what we think he ought to respond. Because, again, you, you don't want me to in that position because I would have done killed a lot of people. My response to, to everything would be just, if it ain't God, he just wipe them out. You know? But that ain't God, amen? He don't respond that way, so therefore I don't respond that way, amen? That's why I ain't killed some of y'all. <laughs> Just kidding, amen? So, so if we know this in our mindset, why does so much of the body of Christ not do this? That ha we have to question, not, you know, I'm tired of questioning what's wrong with the world. We've got to start questioning what's wrong with the church. Amen. Because... What's wrong with the church is not going to be God. And if it's not God wrong with the church, then it's got to be us wrong with the church sometimes. Amen? Amen? Yes. Maybe we're not walking like God walks. Maybe we're not talking like God talks. Maybe we're not acting the way God acts all the time. And we sure ain't responding the way God responds to things. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, then that's a problem. See, in order to have that kind of lifestyle as a Christian, then you've got to know him intimately and personally and not religiously. Amen. And you've got to spend time with him. And you've got, if you're going to spend time with him, you've got to spend time with his word. Therefore, if you don't spend time with the word, you'll, you'll set your whole life up on what you think he would do based on your opinion versus knowing what he did, knowing how he talked, knowing where he walked, knowing how he acted, knowing how he responded. And when you know he did them and he's put power in you to do that, it's going to make 
completely different. But again, it takes, it requires us to do that. You're not going to act like Jesus acts if you don't know Jesus intimately and personally. Even if you get saved, if you just get saved and you don't pursue that relationship, you're still not going to act like Jesus even though you're saved. How many can testify to that? How many know saved people, and they are saved, they, they've, they've accepted Jesus Christ, but they act nothing like him? They don't, oh, come on, somebody. My God, help us. And we're supposed to be what the Bible calls Christ-like. And yet, many Christians are nowhere near what Christ was really like. They, they want a Messiah that fits them, not them fit into the Messiah. Let me prove it to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Therefore, if anyone, everybody say anyone. This includes the most vile person to the person who was really a good one. They just got saved, whoever it may be. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? A new what? Creation. Now watch this. Old things have passed away. Behold, the next word, all things have become new. Now leave that up there for a minute. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. It means when you got born again, you became something you've never been before. I'd never been born again until I got born again. And then when I got born again, I really didn't understand what being born again really was all about, so therefore I wasn't that good at it. And I call it, I had head knowledge salvation. I knew I was going to hell. I knew hell was real. I knew Jesus was real. I knew I had to accept Jesus in order not to go to hell. I had head knowledge of him. And so I got saved, and I, I really got saved. But years later, I got what I call heart knowledge, where my heart wanted a relationship with a Lord and not just a head knowledge of being saved. Not just a get out of hell free card, but a relationship to live in Christ and him and me while I'm alive on earth for his glory, not mine. Amen? And I began, I began that journey with God, and it, man, I'm still on it, man. I'm loving it, and I'm having a blast. But here's the thing about it. Now, watch this. You're a new creation. Old things have passed away. Now, what's some of the old things you think's got to pass away when you get born again? Everything. How you walk, how you talk, how you act, and how you respond. That's how you can tell if someone's got a relationship with God or if they just got a religious spirit. They walk different, they talk different, they act different, and they respond different. That old stuff is not in there anymore because the Spirit of God is in there now. And the Spirit of God was welcomed and it's nurtured in there and it grows in there because that person desires the lifestyle of a Christian, not just the going to heaven part. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's move on. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20 through 22 through 24 says this. He says, that you put off concerning your former what? Conduct. What does conduct mean? How you walked, how you talked, how you acted, how you responded. That's your conduct, amen? That you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows, plural, grows, continues to grow corrupt according to deceitful lust. Now leave that up there. See, my old nature, before I got heart knowledge with God, not just head knowledge, was still growing, even though I was born again, I was still growing in corruption to deceitful lust. Because I still was wanting life to be all about me, about I want to respond how I want to respond, I want to do what I think Jesus would do, for that puts me ahead of Jesus in my thinking, he's got to trail along behind my thinking, which is where a lot of people love Jesus to be. I got news for you, he ain't back there behind your thinking. If you think that, you got stinking thinking. Okay? So that's the way I was. I wanted to have a Jesus that I could determine what he would do based on who I am. Didn't work good. You got to have a Jesus based on who he is, who his word says he is. And then you and I are to line up to that and watch him just take us into places we've never dreamed of. The old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust. That is where a lot of Christians are living their life, even as a Christian. The corruptness in them continues to grow because, they, again, it's not that they're not saved. It's just that they don't want to act like it. Oh, you should preach this Sunday morning. Oh, I may. 
verse 23. Now watch this. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Verse 24. And that you put on the new man which was created according to God. Not just created according to him, but look in what? In true righteousness and, oh my gosh, the word we, don't, we, the word we would love to just boot right out of church now. Holiness. H holiness and hell are two words that church is just trying to ban. Don't talk about being holy. Don't be one of them. You can't do nothing. Can't have no fun. And don't talk about hell and scare people. Without holiness, you're going to know what hell's about. So we preach on both of them here. Amen? Amen? So your new man was created according to God in true righteousness, right standing, which that means right standing, and holiness. But yet you look at the reflection of a most everyday Christian walk, it doesn't reflect God, it doesn't reflect righteousness, and it sure don't reflect holiness most of the time. What does it reflect? Self. I think I need to act like this. I think I need to go ahead and say this. I think I'm going to respond this way because I want to. Is it just me or is it quiet in here tonight? Where are your Wednesday night people? You're to take it easy on us. No, you get this imparted into you. It's your job to take and teach everybody else. First, yes, in love. First John 2, 6 says this. He who says, everybody say says. That's verbal. He who says he abides in him, talking about Christ, ought himself also to walk just as he, Christ, walked. Well, let's read that out of the Message Bible again. 1 John 2, 6, Message Bible says it like this. Anyone who claims to be intimate with God or to live the same kind of life Jesus lived. How many of us today are claiming we're Christians? Then the Bible tells us if we're saying we're going to be like him, then we ought to be like him. Is that not what the word says? To live the same kind of life Jesus lived. In other words, walk like Jesus walked, talk like Jesus talked, act like Jesus is act, and respond the way Jesus responded. How many of you think Jesus ever did any of that stuff in sin? He walked a sinful life. How many of you ever think he talked sinful stuff? Anybody? How many of you ever think his actions were sinful at any time in his life? And how many thinks that he responded to every situation or any situation? His death, his crucifixion, him being beaten, he responded in a sinful manner. Not one time did he ever do it. So why do we think, because the world responds opposite of what Jesus does, that we can be saved and still act like the world? That's good, brother. Ephesians 2.10 for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for, for semi-good works, for bad works, for works the way we want to work them. Come on. And it's quiet up in here. Am I at the Presbyterian Church of Father Eva? <laughs> for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for, everybody say, good works. Good works. Watch this now. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. No, and I leave that up there. Man, I got to preach on this. There are situations that you are walking through right now that God prepared you for those situations. How many would agree with that? Oh, it's good. Yeah, God's good. There are also situations that you're going to walk in in the past, now, and in the future that God ain't got nothing to do with, but he knew that maybe one day you might make a mistake, get in a situation, and he said, I have still prepared beforehand that you should walk like I walk, in them, to them, and through them. Because yes. sin is going to come into your life, either you're going to bring it in, or somebody else is going to bring it in, but it doesn't give you a right to walk, talk, act, or respond in your own power. It gives you the right to walk, talk, act, and respond the way Jesus did. Because he's already prepared you for those things. Do you, do, let me read that to you again. We're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, we should walk in the good works even when it's bad. 
See, we take that scripture and go, well, I can do that as long as everything's going my way and nothing's bad happening in my life and there's no problem, there's no tribulation, there's no pain, there's no sorrow, there's no sickness. Great work. Yeah, I can walk in that. But it also means you walk in good works no matter what the devil throws at you. Mm. Somebody say you should have preached this Sunday. Amen. So therefore, in verse 5, or chapter 5, verse 1 of Ephesians, it says this. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. So we're supposed to imitate, in other words, be just like God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Message Bible, same scripture, Ephesians 5, 1, says it like this. Watch what God does, and then do it, and then you do it, like children learning proper behavior from their parents. Problem is today, parents aren't teaching proper behavior. He never quit. Cause, just because we quit. You know, I was thinking about this the other day. Actually, this, just today, I believe I had this thought. Years ago, when it was parents and kids, and even grandkids, the pecking order was, it was all about what the parents decided was going to happen, happened. The children did not have a say-so, nor was the life lived around the children. The life was lived around the adult parents and what they said was going to happen. When you go to town to get a hamburger, you didn't get asked as a child, what would you like? Well, I don't know. I want chicken. Well, no, wait a minute. I want... No, you're going to get this. Ain't no choice. You didn't get a choice that much. You're going to get this. You're going to get what's on sale or the happy, you know, the little coin or whatever. That's what you're going to get. Now... It's parents, we're catering and making our world around kids. Come on, that's unhealthy. We let kids determine our schedule. We let kids determine what we're going to eat. We let kids determine where we're going to go. If the kids don't, don't like something, we've got to cater around the little children now. Come on. Somebody say, you know that's right. Children are to learn proper behavior from their parents. Parents aren't supposed to act like children. Wow. But today we've got a bunch of parents who want to act like children and then wonder why their kids are so screwed up <laughs> when they get on up in life. And they take them to the pastor and say, would you do something with them? I said, no, if you'd have done something with them back there, they wouldn't be sitting here. Good preaching, Amen. Turn to somebody and say, is that God? Is that God? And that's the title of the message tonight, is that God? Is that God? Now, most of the time when we say that phrase, is that God, as Christians, the first thing that comes to my mind is when I'm dealing with something and I feel the Spirit trying to tell me to do something, okay, now, is that God or not? How many's been there? Come on, raise your hand if you've ever been there. You're questioning, the Lord's told you to say something to somebody, do something for somebody, give something. Do something, and you're in that spiritual check. Okay, God, is this you? Is that God or not? And so while we're trying to figure that out, you know, sometimes the moment passes, sometimes we lose it, sometimes whatever, okay? So most of us are just trying, is this God speaking to me? And, and can I really do what he says do, yada, yada, yada? But the real problem, everybody say the real problem. The real problem is, is that our life is speaking God to people that don't know anything about God. And they're looking at our behavior and they're asking that question, is, is that God? Is, is that the way God talks? Is that the way God acts? Is God going to respond to me the way they responded to me? Wow. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 and 16 says this, Beware of false what? Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous as wolves. Verse 16. You will know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Now leave that up there. Can you go back one? Go back to verse 15 if you can. Beware of false prophets. Now, I'm not calling us false prophets in here tonight, okay? I don't think I am anyway. But what, was, what is a false prophet doing? Now they're, now, they're claiming to be a prophet. Are you listening to me? 
They're praying to be a prophet. What is a prophet? A prophet is someone who represents the voice of God to a people or a nation. Would you agree with that? So they're claiming to be a Christian who represents God in the earth. Are you with me? So what are we talking about here when he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. He's talking about anybody who says they're in Christ, but they don't walk like it, they don't talk like it, they don't act like it, they don't respond like it. He says, watch out for them. Because they're not walking 100% with me, and if you're not 100% with him, then you got some against him. And what we're really talking about here is that person who is claiming Christ, we're talking about their character and their integrity as a Christian. Now, look at here. Beware of false what? false prophets therefore this person is claiming they are speaking and behaving on behalf of God yet they are leading people astray by what how does a false prophet become a false prophet by not walking where Jesus walked not talking like Jesus talks not acting like Jesus acts and not responding the way Jesus responds and folks, that hits any one of us in here. Anytime we get outside the boundaries of those four areas of doing exactly what Jesus done, we're walking in a false whatever identity, and we need to do an identity check tonight. If my old man's passed away, how can that old man still live out of my mouth? How can my old man still walk where I used to walk in sin? How can my old man respond in a way that doesn't glorify God still? If I'm really in Christ. And there's no, I tell people, you're not called to part time Christianity. You're not called to be an undercover Christian and not let people know. Amen? Amen. Now, while you may not be in the quote office of a prophet, the Bible says that we may all prophesy. Amen? You may not be in the office of a prophet. Say amen to that. But you still represent the voice of God in the earth today. Now, the word represents means I am representing what God looks like. How I many would say I represent God? I'm a child of God, therefore I represent God. Raise your hand if that's you. I'm a child of God, I've accepted Jesus Christ, therefore I represent him in the earth. In other words, you are a representer of who God is, how he walks, how he talks, how he acts, how he responds is all seen by lost people and even other Christians, baby Christians or whoever, through your life, through your mouth, through your feet, through your hands, and through your emotions. Yeah, no pressure. Amen? <laughs> it's about how our lives represent God to the world we live around. They're watching our actions. They're watching where we go. They're watching what we say. They're watching how we respond. They're watching us. And then they're asking, is that God? Because they don't know. People who don't have a relationship with God don't know who he is. And so they're looking at the church. They're looking at Christians and they're saying, well, now is that God? I mean, this, this, this Christian over here is just cussing and fussing and wearing this other Christian out about something. That must be God. To save people in an argument, but somebody's watching. Teenagers come downstairs, get out in the foyer, and listen to the way adult Christians talk. And they're going, well, that must be God to yell at somebody. That must be God to, to lose their temper in church. That must, must be God. They're in church, and they're a Christian, and they're an adult. And then we wonder why our kids are rebellious. Is that God? Galatians chapter 5, verse 23 through 26 says this. But the fruit of the Spirit, everybody say the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of who? Not the fruit of the loom, okay? We're not talking about the fruit of the loom. We're not talking about the, the fruit of your loins. We're not talking about the, the fruit of the vineyard. We're talking about the fruit of the third part of God's trinity, which is the Holy Spirit. And again, his first name is what? Holy. Holy. Absolutely. But the fruit of the Spirit 
is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. I don't like that one. Another translation of that is patience. <laughs> Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, next verse, gentleness, self-control, and against such, there's no law. There's no limit of how much you can do this because there's no limit in our God. That's in the Bible. God in the Word are one. He spoke it. It's true. Can I have an amen? amen? So we're to operate in love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, gentleness, faithful, faithful, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's how you walk like Jesus, talk like Jesus, act like Jesus, and respond like Jesus. Anything outside of that, you are out of control. You are out of representing Christ the way he is. You are representing who you have determined he is. I'm not here to represent who I determine he is. I'm here to represent who he said he is. Mm -hmm. He is love. He is joy. He is peace. He is long-suffering. He is kindness. He's goodness. He's faithful. He's gentle. And he has self-control. How many would agree with that? Mm -hmm. And that's who you are if you represent him to the world. But let's take a look at this list and look where most Christians operate. The very first thing was what? God is love. Amen? The first fruit of the Spirit called out is the fruit of love. What do most Christians portray a lot of, though? Hate. Hatred for this. Hatred for religion. Hatred for this. Hatred at the church. Hatred for someone in the church. Hatred for another brother and sister in Christ. Hatred toward this person. Hatred toward that person. Come on, shout me down if I'm telling the truth. Nobody's shouting, so y'all think I'm lying. Number two, spirit, is joy. And the Bible says that for you to be strong in Christ, the joy of the Lord gives you strength. But yet we find most Christians in sorrow and depression because they're always talking about it. They're not happy. They're always ill about something. They're always mad and upset about something and yakking about something. The next one, the third one, is the spirit, the fruit of peace. Most Christians, I'll be honest with you, I know a lot of Christians who's never probably walked 24 hours in their whole salvation with the peace of God on them. I know Christians who are all, they're always tore up about something. They're always in somebody's drama or their drama, and they're just, yeah, yeah, here, and it's a wah, wah, they're here, wah, they're wah. <laughs> they, own old, they own old Mac Satan's farm. They're always in turmoil. They're always in somebody's drama or their own drama. They ain't living in peace because if they're living in peace, their life would reflect a different lifestyle. It would be one appealing to people, not appalling to people. The only people that lifestyle is appealing to are other people who are caught up in that lifestyle. What's the motivation of the lack of peace? It usually comes as motivated by the spirit of fear. I'm afraid I'm not going to be important. I'm afraid somebody's going to do it different than I am. I'm afraid somebody's going to get more glory than I get. I'm afraid somebody's going to be better at something than I am. I'm afraid somebody's not going to do it the way I want to do it. Therefore, I can't be at peace with anything. There's got to be turmoil. I've got to stir up some drama. Look at somebody say, say the drama for your mama. <laughs> Number four, spirit in the fruit is Long-suffering. Long, long-suffering. <laughs> Means more than just a, a little moment of your time. The opposite of long-suffering is people who are just so short-tempered. Come on now. Just hateful every time, every chance they get. They just, bam! And they think it's okay. Some people have created a lifestyle because they know that lifestyle intimidates someone and therefore they get joy out of, oh, no, here he comes. He's going to snap if we don't do what he wants done. You really want to be that person? Because that ain't what Jesus did. Or here she comes. She's going she gonna to go off. I know husbands who walk eggshells around their wife because they don't want their wife to go off. 
And I know wives who walk eggshells around their husbands and go, oh, I don't want to make him mad. you got a pathetic marriage. It needs God. It needs the love of God to come between a husband and wife that you're for each other, you're not against each other. That one don't have to live in fear. That, well, I'm going to set this one off. I'm gonna, but hey, do you know how many marriages live right there where I'm talking about right now? How many, you know how many pastoral relationships live in that? How much leadership in churches and in business operate in that model? Of short-tempered, hateful, going to just crawl all over somebody while I'm at church or while I'm on the job or in my marriage or in my home or at Walmart. We just go off on people. And we're, we're, we are pro, we're representing Christ like that. Touch your neighbor and say, are you nuts? The next one is kindness. Yeah, I'm nuts, but I'm going to screw it on the right boat. I know. Y'all steal my stuff. I stole this from somebody else. Don't worry about it. The next one is kindness. Everybody say kindness. Kindness. How many kind Christians do you ever run into? Very few. Most Christians I know are some of the most meanest Christians I know. Christians are mean, spiteful. If there ain't something in it for them, they ain't going to, no, you forget it, man. If they ain't going to get no glory, they, they, you know, kindness is, is, is even gone in the church. We can't be kind to one another. We can't look past somebody else's faults. We've got to call them out. But God acts with kindness toward us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Don't get much kinder than that. Look at number six, goodness. What's the opposite of goodness? Badness. Goodness, badness. And then the other word I got when I was praying about that is negative. How negative are Christians in today's time? We're one of, we've got the, the most encouraging message to flow out of our mouths, yet we speak the most negative crap that I've ever heard. Always negative. Always concentrating on negative. Man, we have 50 people get saved. Well, you know what? With the crowd here, it should have been at least 60. We baptized 30 people. Huh. Well, I bet the water wasn't warm. <laughs> Always can never be positive, can never stay encouraged. Always discouraged. Always hateful. Always spiteful. And just, 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 just. Christians are mean. You know why God calls us sheep? Because sheep will bite you. Them suckers got teeth, they'll nip you. And just, that's why the shepherd had a stick, just knock them in the head. <laughs> mm hmm. And then the next one, the last three faithfulness. Faithfulness. And of course, there's only one word for the opposite of being faithful, and that's unfaithful. Are we faithful to walk with what Jesus did? Are we faithful to talk? Are we faithful? To, to act, are we faithful to respond? And the overwhelming answer to that to most Christians, including myself, and a lot of times is I'm not faithful in that all the time. I'm, I'm, I'm on a road, though. The last one, or no, the second to the last, gentleness. Woo! We need that in our marriage, we need that in our homes, we need it in our schools, we need it in our life. What's the opposite of gentleness? Harsh rough, bossy, everybody say bossy, bossy britches, again goes back to I want to intimidate somebody, I want to, when I walk in the room I want people to snafu to attention, the only reason somebody should snafu to attention when you walk in the room is because the presence of God on you, we, I agree with that, every Christian when we walk in the room we ought to command that room with the spirit of God flowing off of us. Them, them, them saying, man, man of God or woman of God just walked in, man. Not, oh, God, there's old, there's old bossy. Oh, God, there's one's going to pitch a fit on us. Come on. Harsh, bossy, intimidating. And again, it goes back to usually that person's dealing with a spirit of fear somewhere. It's the reason you act this way. The last one. So important here. Because out of this one flows all the other ones. Self-control. Everybody say self-control. The opposite of self-control is zero discipline. You have no discipline. You are that person who has no patience, who goes off on somebody, who, who thinks it's okay to do that, who, who, who will talk about somebody, who will listen to talk about somebody, who will do all that stuff because you have no control. This is a person 
that one minute they can be praising Jesus and the next minute they just flying off the handle wrecking somebody over the coals about something. And many times they don't see it in them. Now, here's what's funny, especially in the church setting and in the business setting. You'll point it out to somebody else, but you can't even see it in your own self. That's why the Bible put that scripture there. Until you, until you get ready to take the plank out of your eye, don't try to pull a speck out of someone else's. Good preaching, amen. Now, the fruits of the Spirit, or the opposite of the fruits of the Spirit, what is that? Basically, you're going to take those fruits of the Spirit, or opposite fruits, and that is how you're going to respond. That's how you're going to act. That's how you're going to talk and walk to anything that this life on earth throws at you. Come on now. Any situation you get into, good or bad, you've got a choice to show love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, or self-control in. Or you can show hatred, sorrow, depression, turmoil, drama, short-tempered, hateful, mean-spirited, bad, negative, unfaithful, harsh, bossy, intimidating, zero discipline, no control, and fly off the handle about it. Now, let me ask you, where do most Christians you know fall into which category? How many of you know Christians who constantly fall into the fruit of the Spirit in the situations of life? How many of you would say, I know more Christians who fall into the opposite fruits of the Spirit? Come on. Hands going up everywhere. How many of you would say tonight, I am one of those opposite fruits sometimes? How many of you say, I act like that all the time? <laughs> It's our response to life. Would you agree with that tonight? Would you agree? This, this, those are our choices of response to life. But here's the kicker. Our response to life, are you with me? Our response to life is really what our character is. And it's where our integrity is at. And it's also when we respond in one of those fashions. There's always eyes looking at us going, now is that God? Is that God? Is that, is that God? Is that God coming out of you? I'm going to go back to Sunday's message. You decide. But let me just tell you something about your responses, your walk, your talk, and your actions. It's either God or it ain't. There is no in-between actions. You're either representing God or you're representing things that God never done, never will do, and can't do. Can God, now it says God hates sin, but as far as people and things and situations, does God hate that? No. Is God a God of sorrow and depression? Is God a God of turmoil and drama? Is God short-tempered and hateful? Is God mean and spiteful? Is God full of badness and negativity? Is God unfaithful? Is God harsh, bossy, and intimidating? Does God have zero discipline? Does God have, doesn't have any control? And does God fly off the handle at you? And how dare us expect God to love us the way the Word says, but us not to live our lives the way the Word says? Who, again, I, I've been on this kick here lately. Who do you and I think we are? That we can want something from God one way and act another way. Wow. Wow. See, this is the very reason people want nothing to do with God in today's time. Because they don't know God. But they're looking to the church and the people calling themselves Christians that they know in school or see you out at Walmart or in a relationship with you or at the hair salon or out there in the fishing boat together or in doing life together and you're proclaiming Christ but yet they see you and do things and they're thinking in their mind now, is that God? They see you talk bad about somebody. They see you fly off the handle and lose your temper and, and just blast and cuss and act like the rest. Now that's God? And then you invite them to church. Is that God? Is that the God at your church that allows you to act like that and no repentance, no, I mean, you act like you're proud of it. Is that God? Well, they see Christians acting like that. Thus, they stay away from the church. They want nothing to do with the church because if that's church, if that's God, 
I've already got him. Because I cuss and fuss and hate and the whole list there. I'm bossy. I like to intimidate people. So I must, I must be okay with God. Now, so where do they form their idea about what God's church is in the earth? After they've seen your lifestyle and they, they ask the questions, is that God? And they're just ready to throw that thing away. Now they will become influenced by what government and the media says the church is and is doing. Is that not what we're dealing with exactly right now in this generation? Big anti-church, anti-Christian. Why? Because they've seen the way Christians act. They've not seen the fruits of the Spirit in their home. They've not seen the fruits of the Spirit in mom and dad's marriage. They've not seen, they see mom and dad go off. They see their school teacher go off. They see the pastor go off. They see everybody cuss and fuss. And this, this website the other day that got exposed with all these, what, what's the name of it? Madison. Ashley Madison. Do you know there were 400 pastors on that website? 400 pastors. I've got a pastor friend the other day. I talked to a pastor at a large church. He said, it hit my church. I've got people in my church that was on that list. I said, well, I ain't read the list yet. I'm not sure. <laughs> so they, they, they've not put much faith in what we're doing because we're not doing anything different than what they're doing. But God, they know, they know God is real, and they know there's a church in the earth. So they separate you from the church because you ain't acting any different. They ain't got no faith. You ain't got no witness in their life. You ain't got no power to speak to anything into their life. But they're still the living organism as a church that they know of. And so they start believing what the media and the government tells them the church is. And that's exactly where we're at today. A whole generation who's never experienced the power, the love, the long-suffering, the kindness, the gentleness, the faithfulness, the self-controlled church that's representing God, representing him like God is and what like God does and what Jesus was and Jesus did. Instead, we're representing what we feel we should do. For some reason, we feel like we can sin and get away with it. I don't understand it. I, hope, I don't know. I hope, you, I hope I never understand it. So say this with me. Say the way I walk, the way I, walk. The way I, talk, the way I talk, the way I act, the way I act. and the way I, the way I respond equals my character. Now you ask yourself, is that God? Ask yourself, is that God? And it can be God on Sunday morning, but is it still God on Monday when something didn't go your way? Is it, is it still God on Sunday when you didn't get along with somebody in church? Because they got your seat. I've seen it. You in my seat. You need to move. That's my seat. Everybody know that's my seat. You in my parking spot. Don't you park there again. Amen? The way I act, the way I walk, the way I talk, the way I respond, that equals my character and my integrity. Then we have to ask ourselves Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, is that God? And anything less than Yes, and striving, yes, and striving, yes, and striving, yes, and crucifying the flesh and knowing the scriptures that I am in Christ, he is in me. I am to do good works. I am here for his glory. It is him and that lives. I've done. Anything less than that, we're making a mockery of why he sent Jesus to die for us to live. So tonight I want to ask you to go ahead and stand to your feet. And whatever it is that life's thrown at you, are you walking? talking, acting, and responding like Jesus. Whatever tomorrow's going to throw at you. See, that's the, that's the rough stuff. You know where you're at now in the past, and you can repent from that. But let me tell you something. Re true repentance means you ain't going back there again no matter what. Some of you may just want to get a little forgiveness tonight to cover up. But if you want to get real with God, get some real repentance and say, God, I don't want to be the one flying off the handle no more. 
I don't want to be the bossy one. I don't want to be the negative one all the time. I don't want to be the one that loves gossip to hear it, say it, listen to it all the time. I don't want to be short-tempered. I don't want to be hateful. I don't want to be in turmoil and drama. I don't want to be in sorrow. I don't want to be depressed. I don't want to be in hatred in my heart. I don't want to misrepresent you to people, God. I want to perfectly represent you to people. I want to represent you to my spouse. I want to represent you to my kids. I want to represent you to my church. I want to represent you at work. I want to represent you in my community. I want to represent you even at Walmart and those lines, God. Because that's where you're going to need the fruit of the Spirit. You're going to need long-suffering in a Walmart line. It's the biggest amen I got all night. Anyway. The way you act, the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you respond is your character. Is that God? I think we, every one of us can think of some times we've blowed that. And we've acted like a fool, immature, even as adults. If you've ever done that, raise your hand with me. I'll go ahead and do that. I'm the chief sinner among us all. Now I want you to picture the innocence of innocence, a child that's contemplating getting saved or contemplating giving up that there's a God that's real. And I want you to see that time in your life where you're just acting a fool. And I want you to see that child, after you get through, walk up with innocent voice saying, is that God? Sir, ma'am, tell me, is that God? very first thing about this church is real if we can't get real with ourselves we're faking everything else I know it's a heavy message tonight but I'm telling you for such a time as this we've got to have a church that represents God as he is not as we think and to do that my friend tonight I hope you start a journey of an intimate relationship with him. Get to know this man named Jesus. Get to know his character. Get to know his integrity. Get to know how he walked, where he walked, why he walked there. Get to know why he talked the way he did, who he talked to, and how he talked to them. Get to know the way he acted toward everyone, saints and sinners. Get to know how he responded to even death. And when you get to know him, then you'll start acting like him. If you just know of him, it'll be up to you. But when you know him, you'll gladly let it be up to him. And he'll flow through you because he's flowing to you. So tonight, I want you just to pray right now about yourself. And say, God, the way I walk, the way I talk, my actions and my response, Lord, that, that, that makes up my, my character and Lord, tonight, I'm asking you about me in my character. Is that God? And I promise you, you may lie to yourself, but if you ask God, God won't lie to you about it. So ask him if, you, if, you, if you've got the guts tonight, pray that prayer and ask God if your life is his life and you represent him. And if there's anything in your life that's happened so bad that gives you a pass, not to act like he acts. Lord, can I have a pass on this one? That person just straight up lied like a dog about me. So can I have a pass of hatred? Can I have a pass of unforgiveness, Lord? Can I get a pass on being spiteful? Can I get a pass, God, uh, on being negative? Can I, Lord, Lord, I know that gives me a pass now. I can be unfaithful to you, God. Lord, I can, that gives me a pass. I get to be bossy in this situation because I know more, God. Lord, I get to have no control in this situation, God. Do I get a pass? Lord, I'll live the rest of my life over here for you like this. Oh, Lord, I'll shout you praises. I'll, I'll give money. I'll help a lady across the road, God. Just give me a pass on this and this and this and this and these three or these nine or these 20 or whatever you got. See if he'll allow you a pass. If he'll allow it, you just go ahead and function in it. But don't you dare come to me and say he's allowed it because if I, you do, I'm going to say Show me in the Word. Show me in the Word where He allows any of the things that go against the fruit of the Spirit. It's never been His character. It's never been His integrity. So 
So my question is, who lives in you? Because who lives in you will come out of you. Father, I pray tonight that this will be an encouraging word. And Lord, for those of us, we, we may not be living it perfectly, but for, for those of us that has that, that inward desire to live this Christian life, to glorify you, God, we will receive this word with gladness tonight. We'll pray that prayer. God, search inside of me. Lord, know my ways. If there is anything, and Lord, reveal it where I can get rid of it. I don't want to be that going off person. I don't want to be that man or woman of gossip. I don't want to be in that drama. I'm tired of the turmoil, God. I like it in my flesh, but Lord, I know it goes against the spirit, and I want my spirit to become stronger than my flesh, God. I want to quit cussing tonight, God. I want my foul mouth to go because, Lord, you, you never use language like this, God. I want my negative thoughts and my negative mouth to, to go in the name of Jesus. Let me tell you something. You can pray that prayer tonight, and he'll begin the work in you that he's able to complete. Now, listen to my words. He will begin that work of deliverance and restoration and healing that he is able to complete. But I don't know if you can. Well, I do know that you can if you abide in him. He is faithful to complete it unto that day. But in my past, I've not stayed faithful to the completion. Never been a problem with God. It's always been a problem with me not being faithful. I've not been faithful to love every time. I've not been faithful to be gentle. I've not been faithful in self-control. I've not been faithful in kindness many times. <laughs> I've not been faithful in peace and joy and love. But my goodness, is he taking me through the school of it. Woo! And I praise him for that tonight. I don't praise him for the problems, but I praise him that, just like the scripture said a while ago, he's given me strength to go through it now. And so, Father, I thank you. The old man is dead, and we want to keep him dead. Hallelujah. We don't want to try to bring resurrection to the old man. We want to resurrect that new man. Hallelujah. That new woman, that new husband, that new wife, that new son, that new daughter, God, that is filled with your glory and power, God, that is representing you well, not perfect. Again, I hope this has brought as much freedom to you as it has me. He's going to say, well done that day, not perfectly done. But he will say, well done, because he knows the intent of your heart, whether you tried or not. Whether you tried and failed or whether you tried and, and survived and you tried and you just kept on and you kept on and, man, you made course corrections in your life. You changed your attitude. You changed your mindset. You changed what you hear. You changed how you hear it. You changed how you talk about it. You changed how you see things. Hallelujah. God, fill this church with that anointing, God. And we will watch literally a paradigm shift come to a culture, to our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids who will look and they will not have a question and say, is that God? They'll just look and say, hey, that's God. That's how you handle that situation. That's how you walk. That's how a Christian talks. That's how they respond to good. That's how they respond to bad. That's how they respond to all hell coming against them. That's God. Who I want some of that. I can have faith in that because that shows God. Don't you want to be that man? Don't you want to be that woman? Don't you want to be that husband? Don't you want to be that wife? Don't you want to be that dad? Don't you want to be that mom? Don't you want to be that grandfather? Don't you want to be that grandmother? Don't you want to be that aunt? Don't you want to be that uncle? Don't you want to be that brother or sister? Is that not who you're called to be? Father, created in your image, in the likeness of our God, you made us. We represent you every day of our life. We represent you in every situation, good or bad. And it is either in our representing, it's either you in us or it's us in us. But what's in us is what's going to come out. And I'm praying God all over these people tonight. 
I'm praying the spirit of a living God who is all of the fruits of the spirit toward us while we're on this journey. That when we have that moment, we don't stay in that moment and we make the adjustment because of his love, patience and long suffering and kindness and gentleness and discipline in our lives. That's the kind of God you want, isn't it? Come on, is that the kind of God you want? Then that's the son and daughter he wants. He gave you, now it's time for you to give him. The Bible says it's your reasonable duty, not above and beyond. It's not beyond your problems. It's not beyond what the devil's throwed at you. It's not beyond him, guys. You, we don't have to walk like we walk. We don't have to talk like sometimes we talk. We sure don't have to act like we act sometimes. And bless God, we don't have to respond the way we respond in a lot of issues. There is a God inside of us. And he so wants to come out. And tonight is about, is he God? If he is, let's let him out. Amen. So, Father, we thank you that we're here tonight to open the gate and that you have control of our lives, our emotions, everything about us. Mind, mouth, and attitude, God. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Can you, can you just begin to thank him tonight that he loves you too much to leave you where you're at? Lord, you love me too much to leave me anywhere outside the fruits of the Spirit. Lord, if I operate on the, on the right side of all of them but one, you love me too much to leave me in that one area default. Lord, you, you, wanna, you're, you sent a perfect son. You want perfect sons and daughters maturing, growing. And God, you're worth us. You're worth us going through whatever it is. Because we have the promise we're coming out in triumphant victory, God. So, Father, we say this when we say, I bless my Lord. Bless my Savior who lives in me and me in him for his glory. Starting right now, I have understanding, wisdom, and knowledge that I represent. I literally represent who God is, how he walks, how he talks, how he acts, and how he responds in every situation. I do that for my Heavenly Father in Jesus Christ. Amen. Come on, give him glory.